Hello and welcome to today's Center for Healthcare Strategies webinar, made possible by the West Health Policy Center on advancing value-based payment and Medicaid-managed long-term services and supports, opportunities for community-based care. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistics. To eliminate background noise, phone lines are being muted during today's event. There will be a moderated question and answer session following today's presentations. You may submit a question online anytime by clicking the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. Instructions are shown on the screen at this time. Today's event will be recorded and shared publicly on chcs.org. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you please complete a brief online evaluation that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is very important to us, and we hope that you'll take a moment to do this. I'll now turn the webinar over to Michelle Herman Soper, Director at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Great. Thank you so much, Travis, and thank everybody uh, on the phone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Michelle Soper, and today we are going to talk about considerations for states that are seeking to adopt, as Travis said, value based payment or VBP for home and community based services, H or HCBS in Medicaid Managed Long-Term Services and Supports, or MLTSS programs. Those are the three acronyms that you will hear throughout this presentation, and we'll be sure to define them again. Um, so just a quick uh, overview of today. After some speaker introductions, I'll discuss some learnings from a project that we are wrapping up that is funded by the West Health Policy Center um, that are working with states in the last year that are implementing or exploring these models. Then we get to hear from New York and Tennessee who have actually launch these programs and conclude with some national insights and a question and answer period. Um, so if we could skip ahead uh, two slides. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, I'll start with introducing our speakers. Um, Travis noted that I'm the Director of Integrated Care at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. CHCS is a national nonprofit health policy center dedicated to improving the health of low-income Americans. We work with state and federal agencies, health plans, providers, and consumer groups to create programs that better serve beneficiaries of publicly financed care, particularly those with complex needs. At CHCS, I lead work focusing on understanding and implementing best practices related to long-term services and support delivery and Medicare Medicaid integration. Uh, Dr. Khalil Ashair is the Medical Director in the Division of Health Plan Contracting and Oversight and the Division of Long-Term Care at the New York State Department of Health. He has clinical experience in primary care, acute ambulatory care and emergency medicine, and clinical preventive medicine, um, and also continues to practice as a family medicine physician part-time. Erin Kate Kalikia is the Deputy Director of the Division of Long-Term Care for the New York State Department of Health, where she oversees planning, implementation, evaluation, and reporting of the managed long-term care program. She has led implementation of the delivery system reform to value-based payments for more than the 50 managed long-term care plans in the state of New York. Before join joining the Department of Health, Erin Kate served as the Assistant Counsel for the New York State Office of Children and Family Services. Patty Killingsworth is the Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Ten Care, the Chief of Long-Term Services and Supports. She's worked in Medicaid programs in Missouri and Tennessee for two decades, leading system redesign initiatives in both states. And in Tennessee, this includes an MLTFS program in 2010 that has significantly expanded access to home and community-based services and rapidly moving Tennessee towards a rebalanced system. In 2016, she launched a new MLTFS model for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, aligning incentives to help individuals achieve employment and integrated community living. And Deborah Lipson, who is a key project partner um, with us on this work, is a senior fellow at Mathematica Policy Research, a nonpartisan research firm. She has over 30 years of experience as a health policy researcher and is a nationally known expert in Medicaid policy, managed care for vulnerable populations, and long-term services and support. In the past two years, her research has focused on Medicaid managed long-term services and support, including directing two large CMS-funded projects, uh, one that developed tools and resources to help uh, states and feds, the federal government improve oversight of these programs, and another that developed and tested new quality measures for duly eligible beneficiaries and MLTSS enrollees. Um, last but not least, I'm going to turn it over to Amy Herr from the West Health Policy Center, 
um, who we also want to thank for their generous support uh, for this webinar and related activities. And we can advance two slides um, and let Amy say hello. Great, thanks, Michelle. Hi, everyone. If you haven't heard of the West Health Policy Center, we are um, a philanthropy and policy center and medical research organization, all under the West Health umbrella. And we work together to advance a shared mission of lowering healthcare costs and also of enabling seniors to successfully age in place with access to high quality, affordable health and support services that protect their dignity, quality of life and independence. And to do that, we work to develop and advance geriatric friendly models of care um, in both the acute, chronic and LPSS sectors. And we're really excited to support this work to advance um, managed Medicaid LTSS. Um, I, I wanted to especially thank uh, Michelle Soper and her team at the Center for Healthcare Strategies, Deborah Lipson at, at Mathematica Policy Research, and Maria Dominiak at ARAM, um, and our five learning collaborative states that helped us um, put together today's webinar and also develop the toolkit that's coming out today as well. So thanks. Back to you, Michelle. Great, thanks so much, Amy. Um, so let me start off with our, the first section of our presentation. Um, as I mentioned, this will uh, cover considerations for states that are seeking to adopt VBP models um, in managed long-term services and support programs. Um, we're going to focus, I'll tell you a little bit about what we've learned working with state health plans, providers, and other stakeholders in the last year that are implementing or exploring, exploring these models for home and community-based services. Next slide, please. Uh, just for some context, just to start off. Um, first, uh, we have some trends laid out on the slide that are important to this work. State Medicaid programs are pursuing many strategies to improve the quality and cost effectiveness of LTSS, um, including increasingly turning to managed long-term services and support for MLTSS programs to accomplish these goals. At the same time, states are more generally seeking to transform how they pay for healthcare. Uh, generally speaking, payment reform is intended to shift from a fee-for-service system under which providers are paid for each service delivered to value-based payment or VBP approaches that tie payment to better outcomes that can be linked to higher quality, improved health, use of evidence-based or more co coordinated care, or, or cost savings, as some examples. Through our work, several states have recently identified LTSS as a new target for these efforts. Um, however, there are several challenges that we'll go through um, at length today with developing and implementing these models for home and community-based services um, due to some unique characteristics of HCBS finance, financing and delivery. Um, and a, some short examples include, but key examples, include provider capacity to assume financial risk and build required infrastructure, uh, HCBS quality management and data collection, and also the opportunity to achieve Medicaid savings for duly eligible beneficiaries, which comprise a large uh, portion of these enrollees, um, if this is not part of a Medicare Medicaid integrated program. Um, in these cases, savings often accrue um, to acute care services that are covered by Medicare. Um, next slide, please. So the project that we're talking about, um, advancing value in Medicaid MLTSS, um, as as we know, it was uh, uh, generously supported by the West Health Policy Center, and we conducted this work in partnership with Mathematica Policy Research and Aram Actuarial Consulting. We worked with several states and, and other stakeholders on um, developing several activities. The main activity was a state learning collaborative with Minnesota, New York, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia, where we shared best practices um, and learned from each other about developing these models. Um, today, and we're very excited about this and have a link at the end of the presentation, um, we released a new publication, Achieving Value in Medicaid Home and Community-Based Care, um, that highlights many of our findings. Um, but today, we'll, during my presentation, we'll discuss four buckets of findings and learnings from our project um, that we learned from the states that are developing these programs. That includes defining policy and program goals, selecting quality measures, selecting payment models, and then operational and practical considerations to make it work. So we'll go through those uh, four buckets of takeaways next. So the first step in designing a value-based payment model is to clearly articulate the policy goals that a state wants to achieve, and then identify if and how to focus value-based payment efforts to support those goals. 
Um, so just to note that VDP is not a goal in and of itself. These models are actually tools that can advance state policy goals. And examples of those might include um, a system-wide goal. So for example, New York's initiative to reduce potentially avoidable hospitalizations statewide by 25%, um, or those that are more narrowly targeted to an MLTSS program, such as increasing access to home and community services or improving member satisfaction. Um, then states can evaluate whether VDP is the right tool or strategy to support these goals, and if so, what role it should play. So if there are several um, considerations for states as they evaluate um, this promise, including their capacity and existing initiatives that are related to this, their ability to commit to a long-term plan, um, potential to improve value for duly eligible beneficiaries via integrated care, and also the availability, availability of a stable source of funding to get these models off the ground. After a state has decided to use VBP to advance a policy goal, it's also too important to define what value means in the context of MLTSS programs. Generally speaking, value-based payment programs seek to improve the value, um, which generally means improving the quality of care provided while at the same time reducing costs. Um, VBP initiatives for medical care are often more straightforward to link to payment incentives um, due to a wide array of available standardized measures that are not available for MLTSS programs, and we'll talk about that next. Um, in addition, we've heard from states and several stakeholders several concerns about looking for LTSS savings in these models, and that in many cases, slowing the co uh, growth of LTSS costs per beneficiary may be a more realistic goal, or possibly spending the same amount or at times even more to meet program goals. Um, so the next set of considerations that we looked at um, in this project is selecting quality measures. Um, performance measures are the foundation on which these systems are built. Um, and performance of MLTSS plans and HCBS providers can be measured in several ways or through several domains. So some examples of those include rebalancing um, services from institutional care to the community through diversion or promoting community integration transitioning individuals successfully from hospitals into nursing facilities back to community settings, um, reducing potentially avoidable and unnecessary care, improving physical health outcomes, and maintaining or slowing the decline of functional status, improving quality of life, or even improving the skills, training, and stability of the HCBS workforce. So there's a lot of ways that states can, can choose to define quality. Um, then there are several measures available to begin the search, um, but there are very few standardized nationally recognized measures um, on which to draw from. So as a consequence, even though they have a lot of options, states don't have a playbook or a standard set of measures they can use to assess performance. Um, a quick note too, but an important note, is to um, convene a broad group of stakeholders as states are selecting these measures. This includes plans and providers who will be responsible for collecting and reporting data on these measures and also including beneficiaries to ensure that you're measuring what's important to the people in the program. Once measures are selected, there are several other criteria um, that SAGE could think about when they're thinking about which measures should actually be used for bonuses or other financial incentives, or another way to think about it is which measures should payment, to which measures should payment be linked. So first, circling back to defining policy goals, the measures should support whatever goals they seek to achieve. Feasibility is important. Um, not all important program activities and related improvements are easy to measure. Um, so states need to assess how feasible it is to collect complete, accurate, and timely data um, to report on these measures. Accountability is another important consideration. Measures using these models should be those which plans and providers have the ability to control or influence. It can be hard to control outcomes if, um, when outcomes are influenced by many factors other than the services and supports that are covered by the plan or delivered by the HCBS providers. So this is particularly important for duly eligible beneficiaries enrolled in MLTSS if their Medicare services are out of those plans purviews. Um, states might prefer to use home and uh, measures for HCBS that reflect the outcomes that matter most to beneficiaries, which are generally assessed through surveys. There are challenges, including expense, um, often small sample sizes, um, and the need to ensure reliability among the people who are collecting this information. Um, so that can be challenging. And then lastly, once these uh, considerations are met, um, determining performance targets or benchmarks to achieve financial bonuses or shared savings. And they could, there's many ways that states can structure this or plans to structure this, including requiring a provider to meet or exceed a specified score, 
or maybe comparing a provider to his or her performance in the previous measurement period. So there are um, several considerations detailed um, that are detailed in the publication. So the third set of criteria um, after selecting quality measures are selecting the payment models. So the payment approach taken by states and managed care plans um, can influence provider behavior, which creates an opportunity for states and their plan partners to achieve program goals. Um, as we mentioned earlier, most states and managed care plans pay for home and community-based services now in a fee-for-service model. Uh, the Health Care Payment Learning and Action Network, or LAN, um, which is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, created a framework to establish a standard terminology across both Medicare and Medicaid to describe payment models. And that has been, even though not all states use this model in their programs, many do, and this has been very helpful in um, thinking about these models under this framework. So just some examples of um, payment models that can be used for home and community-based services. Um, category uh, two, three, and four, um, and actually let me back up. The LAN uh, framework has four categories of, of payment models. The first is considered to be fee-for-service, and two, three, and four are considered um, in our work as UBP initiatives. Category two approaches are based on fee-for-service, but it does include some link to quality and value, and this often serves as a starting point to engage payers and providers in measuring and assessing the quality of care being delivered. Um, one example here is category 2C, which rewards entities for achieving predefined targets or measures. Um, these models can include incentive payments, withholds, or penalties. Um, these models move more towards risk-based risk approaches in categories 3 and 4, where prov providers are held accountable for the cost and outcomes uh, of services delivered. Category three models might include um, an episode-based payment where there is a lump sum paid for a set of services uh, for a specific episode of care within a defined period. And shared savings models, um, these include performance bonus or withholds or shared savings and losses that are tied to a total cost of care, um, which in this case would include long-term services and support. The last category, um, the provide, which is the um, highest degree of risk, Payment models, um, this includes payment models where the provider organization is responsible for a predefined set of services for a defined population. This shifts financial risk to the provider organization and alliance incentives, uh, incentives across providers, um, which increases the potential for more greater efficiencies and improved outcomes. Um, and then, oh, and I should say to you before we move on, most existing models, this point is at the bottom of the slide, in um, home and community-based services right now includes some link to uh, quality and value, but there is uh, limited risk sharing across the models that we've seen at this point. So similar to the quality measures, there are several considerations for selecting payment models, um, include, including determining the most appropriate approach and incentive amount. So similar to performance measures, identifying which payment models are the most aligned with policy goals. Um, thinking about which models would be most effective in changing provider behavior. The financial incentive should be high enough to engage providers and drive change. Um, and the right incentive amount can vary from provider to provider and, and market to market based on unique circumstances. Thinking about the type of value-based payment arrangement, um, which type is most feasible in the current environment. So this might include what is already in existence in the state or market and the provider's level of sophistication and ability to accept financial risk whether or not there is a um, return on investment and plan for long-term sustainability to make sure that providers continue to be supported. Um, lastly, something that we've focused on in this project, which is what we call non-financial incentives. This might be another lever to increase provider engagement and improve performance. So as opposed to financial bonuses, this might include report cards or data reporting, um, auto assignment algorithms, or preferred referrals to increase the number of clients or members that providers see, uh, marketing, uh, bonuses for workforce training. So while money might money is a motivating factor, it might not be the only way to reward um, good behavior uh, or, or good practices and influence uh, provider behavior. The last area that we focused on, um, we called operational considerations. Um, and these are things that states identified as key considerations when they were during design and as they were getting ready to launch their program. The first, the first item here is to think about uh, managed care contract design. Um, both states and managed care plans that we worked with on this project agree that managed care plans should have some flexibility 
to develop their own payment models and contracting relationships with providers. Um, however, states uh, should consider developing some uh, overarching standards or what we call guardrails to ensure consistency and performance metrics and reporting requirements across all managed care plans and providers. This was very important to reducing uh, the provider burden of participating in these models. Um, assessing provider readiness and capacity uh, to participate in these arrangements is very important too. Um, HCBS provider agencies tend to face many challenges to participating in value-based payment models, um, including limited capital to support risk-bearing arrangements or fewer reserves to cover reductions in revenue. The so states might consider doing a target analysis to identify what could be most effective to support providers in different markets. So some of these um, supports might include investing in and helping providers learn to use IT or systems to support data collection and reporting. I should note that the data collection piece was identified as extremely important throughout a lot of our work. Providing education or technical assistance to help providers participate in these models, or thinking about the types of grants or um, actual infrastructure supports to help build up uh, business acumen and uh, the capacity, the physical capacity to support these requirements. And then lastly, um, engaging stakeholders, again, is just a very key your key point, I think we'll hear about that from our states today, but that uh, robust frequent and ongoing engagement throughout these programs is very important. So I'll conclude with uh, some summary points, a few of which I've mentioned throughout that, uh, that we sort of walked away from this project with as advice for other states. The first one is to understand that VDP is a tool to advance clearly defined policy goals within an MLKSS program or more broadly in the Medicaid system as opposed to a goal itself. Um, going slow and building these models is an incremental process um, requiring often several fits and starts and troubleshooting and ample input from stakeholders. Um, and on that, uh, incorporating ongoing efforts to assess and improve program design and operations into your work plan, um, including um, stakeholder input is really important to ensure that the programs achieve objectives. Acknowledging that there is no, not a single standard set of HCBS measures that states can use to assess performance, but there are, are several measures that might be possible um, that directly support policy goals and through which data can feasibly be collected. Encouraging managed care plan innovation. We saw a lot of innovation from the plans that we worked with, so wanted to highlight the importance of that um, and being flexible around the types of models that they use, but also maintaining a constant state oversight presence to make sure that you're keeping tabs on what's working and what's not and when to step in if necessary. And then lastly, supporting workforce development efforts for the home and community-based provider community um, and developing targeted strategies to build the provider's capacity. And again, this can vary significantly across providers in different markets. Um, so those are our key findings. Um, and I think we will keep on going for the sake of time. And I'm happy to turn it over to um, Khalil and Aaron Kate to uh, talk about New York's efforts. Thank you very much, Michelle, and hello, everyone. Um, and thank you uh, for giving New York State uh, DOH the opportunity to share with you our value based payment strategy and experience, especially uh, as it relates to uh, managed long term care services and supports. Um, a lot has been going on in New York State over the past year or so um, in terms of developing our VBP strategy, both in mainstream Medicaid managed care um, and uh, uh, Medicaid managed long-term care. Um, our accomplishments um, in uh, developing our Medicaid managed long-term care VBP strategy was especially rewarding given the short-term sorry, the short time frame and the limited resources uh, that we had to work with uh, compared to mainstream Medicaid managed care. And today, um, uh, we will be sharing with you an overview of what we have accomplished so far in Medicaid managed long-term care value-based payment in terms of program design, uh, quality metrics, and stakeholder engagement and VBP model uptake. Uh, New York State generally uh, views the value-based model of payment as the future of uh, Medicaid managed care 
and our short-term goal is to have each uh, managed uh, each Medicaid managed care plan in New York State adopt a VBP model um, of payment that rewards value um, over volume for at least 80 to 90 percent of their Medicaid payments to providers by the year 2020. So uh, one of the most important key features um, of our VBP initiative in New York State is that we um, is, that, is that our VPP model has a very strong stakeholder engagement component. Uh, in fact, our VBP initiative is designed in a way that we cannot proceed with implementing a VBP approach without first getting back um, uh, or getting feedback uh, from the stakeholder community. Um, and this slide uh, shows the key elements or players um, that are involved in developing and maintaining our overall VBP strategy in New York State. Um, the Medicaid VBP initiative in New York State is led by the New York State Department of Health Office of Health Insurance Programs, but to help develop a VBP uh, strategy and monitor its implementation, New York State DOH established uh, what is known as the VBP War Group, uh, which is basically a governing body made up of representatives uh, from the entire spectrum of the healthcare delivery system, uh, including physicians, health plan associations, hospital associations, legal firms, um, other state government agencies, community-based organizations, patient advocacy groups, and other industry experts. All New York State Medicaid VBP initiatives must be approved by the VBP work group before they can be rolled out and implemented. Under the VBP work group, um, New York State established smaller stakeholder subcommittees and clinical advisory groups, known as the CAGs. These stakeholder subcommittees and clinical advisory groups are made up of industry experts who help provide the VBP um, design recommendations to the VBP work group and the state and help shape and develop our VBP initiative in New York State. Our New York State VBP initiative includes a variety of different VBP arrangement types um, from which plans and providers can choose from and engage in. This includes a number of different mainstream Medicaid managed care VBP arrangements, as well as a number of VBP arrangements that are targeted towards patients with special needs. This includes um, MLTC, uh, managed long-term care, uh, VBP arrangements, which takes into account the unique needs um, of the long-term care, duly eligible uh, patient popu population. Um, MLTC VBP arrangements are intended to be total cost of the subpopulation VBP arrangements, where providers take responsibility for the total cost of care and the total quality of care that is delivered to the Medicaid member. Uh, they are um, specifically designed and tailored to ensure that the unique needs of the long-term care duly eligible community uh, or uh, duly eligible population um, are being captured and adequately met. The New York State um, MLTC VBP arrangement currently includes two risk levels to choose from, MLTC level one VBP arrangements and MLTC level two VBP arrangements. This slide uh, provides a high level overview of MLTC level one VBP arrangements. Uh, level one VBP risk arrangements involve, um, involve MCOs paying the providers a bonus if the providers meet or exceed uh, certain quality measure targets that they negotiated with, excuse me, that they negotiated with the plans. 
the providers in this type of VBP arrangement include licensed home care service agencies, certified home care agencies, uh, as well as skilled nursing facilities. Um, the quality measures for level one MLTC VBP arrangements are actually a subset of the quality measures that are currently being used in the New York State's MLTC Quality Initi Initiative Program um, and the New York State uh, Nursing Home Quality Initiative Program that the state has uh, with the managed care plans. So uh, there is an alignment here between what the state holds the managed care plans accountable to um, and what the managed care plans holds the providers accountable to. Our uh, Partially capitated MLTC plans, um, unfortunately, do not have access to acute care or Medicare data at this time. And this presented a challenge to us when developing our value, when, when we first developed our value-based payment strategy uh, for the partially capitated MLTC plans. Um, it made us question uh, our ability uh, to establish a total cost of care VBP arrangement without um, having access to acute care medical data. However, uh, we quickly found an answer uh, to our dilemma in our uh, CMS approved VBP roadmap, uh, which allowed the use of a potentially avoidable hospitalization measure as a proxy or in lieu of uh, acute care medical data. And that is until such time that alignment uh, with Medicare uh, becomes possible. Uh, thus, um, our potentially avoidable hospitalization measure is a key component um, of our VBP approach uh, for the MLTC plans. Given its simple design, New York State was able to roll out its MLTC Level 1 uh, VPP strategy to the uh, partially capitated MLTC plans pretty quickly. Um, and towards the end of uh, last year, we instructed all the partially capitated MLTC plans to convert all their home care agencies um, and a skilled nursing facility provider contracts to level one VBP arrangements by December 31st, 2017. I'm sorry, I'm just changing the slide here. All right, sorry uh, about this. Um, so, so this slide here provides a high-level overview of MLTC Level 2 VPP arrangements. Now, MLTC Level 2 VPP arrangements are also a pay-for-performance uh, agreement between um, MLTC plans and providers where incentive payments to providers are based on meeting performance targets uh, for quality measures agreed to in a VPP contract but also um, with the addition of a downside risk component. Uh, so to meet the level two definition, uh, plans and providers must establish a minimum downside of 1% of total annual expenditures in the contract between um, uh, the plan and the provider. Plans and providers may use any reasonable methodology to uh, calculate the qu uh, quality bonus or withhold amount, including the use of uh, the prior year's expenditures. Plans and providers uh, would still uh, maintain uh, flexibility to negotiate higher risk shirt savings um, if, they, uh, if they like to. Um, MLC level, MLTC level two VPP arrangements are open uh, to various types of providers, including uh, licensed home care agencies, certified home care agencies, and skilled nursing facilities, just like level one VPP arrangements. As far as quality measures are concerned, um, MLTC, MLTC level two VPP contracts must include the MLTC VPP potentially avoidable hospitalization measure. In addition, um, one additional 
measure uh, from the MLTC VBP quality measure set must also be included as a pay for performance measure as deemed appropriate by the contracting uh, parties. Uh, all uh, required VBP uh, quality measures, um, including the pH quality measure, will be calculated by New York State DOH for the MCO provider VPP contracting parties. Uh, New York State DOH will provide these quality measure calculations to the um, MLDC plans who are then expected to pass them on to their contracting providers. So as you can see, both level one and level two MLDC VPP arrangements have the same quality measure set. And this quality measure set uh, includes a subset of the uh, measures that are currently being used in the New York State uh, MLTC Quality uh, Incentive Program and the uh, New York State's Nursing Home Quality Initiative Program uh, that the state has with the plans. So again, there is an alignment here between what the state what the state holds the MCO is accountable to in terms of quality and what the MCOs holds the providers uh, accountable to. Also, um, both level one and level two MLTC um, VPP arrangements include the potentially avoidable hospitalization measure. Uh, and that is to compensate for the MLTC plan's lack of access to acute care or Medicare data at this time. Uh, the PAH measure um, uh, is calculated by uh, our Office of Quality and Patient Safety using SPARCS data, uh, which is which stands for Statewide Planning and Research Cooperative System data, which is basically an all-payer hospital file that um, includes the um, preliminary discharge diagnoses um, allowing OQPS, um, our Office of uh, Quality and Patient Safety, to identify hospitalizations that were potentially uh, avoidable. So this slide shows at a very high level how the potentially avoidable hospitalization quality measure is used in the uh, partially capitated MLTC VBP arrangements. Uh, basically, uh, New York State DOH will calculate risk adjusted a potentially avoidable hospitalization quality measure rates, which will be used in VBP performance uh, premium adjustments for the MLTC plans. This in turn translates to a VBP uh, performance payment adjustment for the provider. Thus, the uh, potentially avoidable hospitalization quality measure is not only used as an outcome measure of, 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 of care quality, uh, but it is also used as uh, it's also used to incentivize plans and providers to provide better care through premium and rate adjustments. Now, all of our New York State VPP approaches um, were, were, were great, greatly impacted by uh, stakeholder engagements that helped shape our VPP strategies. And this is especially true for long-term care VPP strategies and arrangements. Some examples of stakeholder engagement efforts that we have underwent over the past year include holding multiple uh, meetings with um, MLTC clinical advisory groups to gather feedback from key stakeholders and industry experts, um, holding MLTC sessions at the VVP boot camps that were conducted throughout the state um, from October 2017 to February 2018, um, and engaging the plans through a VVP readiness survey that assessed the plan's willingness and capability to engage in VBP arrangements. Uh, in addition, we have conducted one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, MCO le uh, leadership 
uh, to provide us with feedback and answer their questions and concerns. Um, we have also um, held multiple stakeholder meetings um, outside the traditional um, MLTC CAGs uh, to um, help fine tune our MLTC VBP approaches. We have also conducted a uh, long term care VBP learning series to provide plans and providers with a platform to share innovative uh, VBP ideas and discuss uh, challenges. Now, because the plans and the plans trade associations have been extensively involved in developing much of our VBP strategies. Um, the response from the health plans uh, to our VBP approaches and requirements have been very positive uh, so far. And the uh, latest survey of the partially capitated uh, MLTC plans showed uh, good compliance with our VBP directives with more than 78% of all MLTC plan provider contracts now converted to uh, level one VBP arrangements. Now, throughout our long-term care VBP design process, we have encountered, and in fact continue to encounter some challenges that inspire us to work harder towards finding solutions to further advance our VBP program. Um, some of the implementation challenges uh, include the lack of uh, integration and alignment with Medicare for the partially capitated MLTC plans at this time. Uh, however, we are working, you know, uh, with CMS on, on, on establishing such an alignment, hopefully, in the near future. Um, um, other implementation challenges include the paucity of vetted and endorsed quality measures that are applicable and relevant to the duly, uh, to, to the duly el eligible population. Um, another challenge is finding ways uh, to effectively engage the various different highly specialized long-term care providers in VBP arrangements. Uh, and also finding ways to realize savings in VPP arrangements that are limited to long-term care services without cutting um, down on personal care hours. Um, other cha another challenge is uh, also is, uh, is identifying the ideal long-term care provider who can effectively and feasibly control the total cost and total quality of care that is delivered to the Medicaid members. Also other challenges include avoiding um, the duplication of care management services uh, between plan and VPP contractors, especially since now the providers or the VPP, VPP contractors do have uh, care management responsibilities and we just don't, don't wanna duplicate that uh, with what the plans are currently doing. Uh, also, another challenge is the feasibility of involving small-sized plans in VVP arrangements, um, and also, last but not least, securing the infrastructure needed um, for plans and providers to engage in VVP arrangements and securing the financial incentives to jumpstart VVP contracting. So thank you, everyone. Uh, this was just a brief overview, again, a uh, high-level overview of our um, um, MLTC uh, VBP arrangement uh, approaches, uh, level one and level two. Um, and uh, please, I mean, I, I, feel free to ask any questions uh, you like, um, or you know, even after the, after after this presentation, uh, please also feel free to contact us at the emails. Uh, listed on this slide, um, and we'd be happy to get back to you. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation of New York's program. I think in the interest of time, we will turn it over to Patty Killingsworth in Tennessee. Um, but after all presenters are done, we will be taking questions and answers. Um, we have a few in now, so please uh, keep them coming. Thank you.
Thanks, Michelle, and hello, everyone. Um, I, too, want to thank CHCS and, and the West Health Policy Center, as well as their partners at Mathematica and Aram Consulting, for um, focusing on this really important work and, and facilitating this collaboration among states. I also really want to recommend the document that's being released today. I think it is a very content-rich toolkit of strategies, considerations, and guidance that states can use to really customize um, and implement their own unique value-based payment approaches. So please um, take advantage of that uh, document. I think if it had been available to us when we had begun this journey several years ago, we would be much further down the path. Turning to the first slide, I want to talk just a little bit about our experience in Tennessee. And by way of quick review, our service delivery system in Tennessee is largely a managed care program and has been now for almost a quarter of a century. Um, our entire Medicaid population is in managed care, and that includes dual eligibles. It includes people with disabilities. So no populations are carved out of managed care. As Michelle mentioned, we do have two MLTSS programs. The first began in 2010 for older adults and adults with physical disabilities. And then more recently in 2016, an MLTSS program for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that we call Employment and Community First Choices. It was really, if you turn to the next slide, right in between those two implementations that we started our value-based payment journey and began to experience some of the challenges in implementing value-based payment in uh, long-term services and supports. And Michelle highlighted some of these, so I'll hit on them fairly briefly. I think an important one is really around how you define value, especially as it relates to long-term services and supports. Importantly, as she pointed out, it's not just about cost. Um, and, and we know that good outcomes may cost more, at least in the beginning, and we as states may be willing to invest more in paying for a service if indeed it produces the outcomes that we really want to support people to be able to achieve in their own lives. Beyond being able to define value, then, we have to be able to measure it, and we know that there is a lack of standardized measures that are available and uniformly used across the country for measuring the value of long-term services and supports, in particular home and community-based services, and, and even more so a lack of measures which really focus on measuring things from the perspective of people who receive services and supports, the things that they say really matter to them. If we can figure out how to define value and we can figure out how we're going to measure value, then the question becomes, can we actually demonstrate it? Do providers and programs have the capacity to be able to achieve the things we have defined as valuable outcomes? Um, and, and there's tremendous diversity among LTSS providers, particularly among home and community-based services providers. They have different levels of sophistication with respect to their ability to collect and report data. They have various levels of sophistication with their ability to use that data to implement quality improvement processes and drive quality improvement. Uh, and all of that really has to be taken into account if you're going to then begin paying based on their ability to demonstrate those outcomes. Really important to point out that one of the challenges of working with HCBS providers is that they tend to not be very well capitalized. And so when you begin to change payment methodologies, it can be very difficult for them. Oftentimes there aren't new resources that can be brought to bear in implementing these programs. Um, and so um, uh, it, it can make it difficult for providers to survive, again, if they're not able to be able to demonstrate the kinds of quality outcomes that you're looking for. And then finally, let, let's remember, as Michelle pointed out, that value-based payment is not an end unto itself. We really are leveraging it as a tool, in most cases, to try to transform some aspect of our service delivery system to one that helps to produce better outcomes. And if you turn to the next slide, it clearly depicts what we all know is that systems transformation is where things get a little bit challenging. 
If we then turn to the next slide, I want to talk about some of the policy decisions that we've made to try to really leverage value-based payment as a tool for system transformation. For us, we chose to focus based on the member experience to define uh, value, to measure value, and to pay for quality. Um, that was driven both by a statutory requirement, but it was also driven importantly by all of the feedback that we received from people who received services and from their family members, as well as other key stakeholders. We decided to develop a statewide payment reform approach rather than allowing health plans to develop their own. We believe that's valuable for providers. And importantly, it begins to align efforts across the system around a set of key values and metrics that we want to be able to achieve so that everyone is working towards the same goal. We've quickly realized that value-based payment is a very slow, sometimes um, developmental process. But if we just decide what we're going to measure and we begin to pay based on those expectations, that providers will not be set up for success. So what we really have to do is work with providers to help them develop infrastructure and capacity to be able to demonstrate the kinds of outcomes that we value um, and then begin to pay for actual performance and continually raise the bar over the course of time. Transparency is a key part of the process, making sure that everyone understands the expectations and get clear feedback on their performance so that they're able to continue to improve. And then ongoing stakeholder engagement broadly, yes, with providers, but more broadly through people who receive services and supports and other key stakeholders to make sure that we're hearing all of the different perspectives on the work. Turning to the next slide, the name of our value-based payment approach in long-term services and supports in Tennessee is called QUILT, Quality Improvement in LTSS. Again, it's a system-wide LTSS, system-wide payment reform initiative really focused around quality from the member's perspective. It is a part of a broader payment reform strategy for our state, um, which really cuts across all of the different Medicaid programs and services that we provide. Um, it is about transforming, using payment as a mechanism to transform the system and align incentives around the things that people say matter most to them and that most impacts their daily lives. And does include workforce development as really a foundational element. If we don't elevate the quality of the workforce where care really happens on a day-to-day -day basis, we'll never get to a place where we're able to deliver high-quality long-term services and supports. The next slide really provides a high-level overview of our three broad areas of our quilt initiative. We have an, uh, components that are based solely on nursing facilities, um, both nursing facilities broadly as well as a small subset of nursing facility services we call enhanced respiratory care. These are people who are primarily ventilator dependent or have other kinds of very significant chronic respiratory care needs. Then we have a whole array of initiatives around home and community-based services. I'll hit a few of those today. And a third set of strategies that are really focused around workforce development. Turning to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the payment models or approaches, beginning um, quickly with nursing facility quilts. I know we're talking primarily about home and community-based services, but we started here and we learned a lot here. This is a high-level view of our quality framework um, and the measures that we are really looking at with uh, respect to nursing facility payment. If you'll note um, satisfaction, culture change, quality of life, and all of the staffing measures comprise all but 10 points of the total 100 points possible. So clinical performance really uh, was valued least, if you will, by the people who uh, provided input into the development of this program, and it was very broad-based input. Turning to the next slide, what that really looks like is both a quality incentive component in each facility's per diem rate, that is um, at least 4% of the total projected fiscal year expenditures for nursing facility services. 
that 4% will continue to increase at two times the rate of inflation until we get to a threshold level of 10% of total projected nursing facilities expenditures being driven based on quality performance and will remain at 10% as a minimum threshold going forward after that. On top of that, above and beyond that, other components of nursing facility rates are now quality informed as well, um, with uh, including both direct care, which is the largest rate component, and then the fair rental value, incentivizing things like investments in staff and staff training and staff development, as well as investments in uh, expanding the capacity of private rooms that are available to Medicaid residents. Moving then to looking at home and community-based services, a quick look at a, a value-based payment model that we implemented in a new behavioral health crisis prevention intervention stabilization service for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who experience challenging behaviors. Um, and, and the model really is built around an expectation that the provider is working with paid and unpaid caregivers to really help build their capacity to provide better supports to that individual to minimize the likelihood of crisis events um, or to stabilize those crisis events should they occur so that we're promoting community tenure and other aspects of um, good quality of life in the community that we want to achieve. It's a monthly case rate, um, so it's more of a, 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 a type three payment model if you go back to the payment models that Michelle talked about, um, which is really uh, designed to support uh, improvement in that person's life over the course of time, greater independence, less reliance on intervention by the provider, and then has a comprehensive set of data metrics that we collect that we are using to build out other uh, value-based um, payment components of the reimbursement structure. So yes, some things tied to cost and utilization, but many things that are tied to things beyond cost and utilization, which we think has the, the most significant impact on that person's quality of life. Things like community tenure, things like stability in those living arrangements in the community and participation in competitive integrated employment. Since we had started value-based payment, by the time we got to our new Employment and Community First Choices program, which is on the next slide, we were actually able to roll that program out with value-based payment already in place. And we did that in our 14 different employment services that are a part of that program. Remember, it has a focus on really helping people achieve competitive integrated employment. All of the upfront services that we provide that lead to employment are reimbursed on an outcome basis. Once that service is completed and the outcome that is supposed to be achieved through the delivery of that service is actually completed, then that provider is eligible for that payment. For job development and self-employment startup, this is when a person actually starts working. Again, it's outcome-based reimbursement. We're going to pay once the person is employed. We're going to tier that payment based on the individual's acuity level or level of need, recognizing that it can be more challenging to help a person with more significant needs become employed in an integrated setting and at a competitive wage. And we're going to pay that in phases over the course of time to support tenure in that job placement. And then finally, for job coaching, we also have tiered reimbursement, which takes into account, again, the person's level of need, but also the length of time they've been employed and the amount of paid support that they require as a percentage of the total hours worked. What that really means is that we want to reward providers, pay them more, if they are successful in supporting that person and becoming more independent in the employment setting, whether that is um, the ability to do more for themselves, whether it is leveraging technology that supports independence, or in some cases, helping to build natural supports in the work environment that reduce the need for paid supports and allow those to fade over the course of time.
Turning then to talking about workforce development, we are developing a comprehensive competency-based workforce development uh, training program. And there are more, uh, there's a lot more detail about that program in some slides that will be in the appendix of this presentation once it's posted. So I won't dig too deep in it, but if you turn to the next slide, I'll hit a few highlights. We have engaged national subject matter experts in developing this curriculum that is based on the CMS Direct Service Workforce Core Competencies that were released in 2014. We've worked with our um, higher education system, our post-secondary system in Tennessee, to be able to award college credit and a post-secondary credential for completing the training program and to embed that within a variety of existing and a potential new degree path. We are working with our community colleges and our colleges of applied technology who will actually deliver the training program. And we've been able to leverage some existing last dollar funding programs um, that will allow uh, workers who want to complete this training to have the training essentially paid for via scholarship. So there's not a financial barrier to being able to do the training. It will support some work that our governor has underway to try to get to 55% of our population having some some sort of a post-secondary credential and is supported by a pre and early service learning component that people participate in first when they initial come, initially come into employment. That program begins to launch in January of next year and we'll do a statewide rollout across more of the community colleges and technical schools in the fall. When we look at some of the things that we know about workforce challenges, we know that having competency-based training, if you turn to the next slide, is really important, but we know that that in and of itself is not enough, that you still have to be able to align incentives at the worker level, being able to allow them to earn higher wages as they become more competent and qualified, and also at the provider level, having providers incentivized to have higher quality staff, and also teaching providers the things that they need to know to improve their ability to recruit and retain really high quality employees. So if you turn to the next slide, the next thing that we're doing in value-based payment around workforce development involves both workforce capacity to building investments as well as incentives. And the investments really begin with the collection of workforce data. It's really important that providers understand um, what their uh, workforce looks like, how often it's turning over, that they understand uh, their experience relative to other providers, and that they know how to use that data then to target improvements over the course of time for their agency. It's also really important for us as a state to be able to do the same thing, to know if the reforms that we're implementing through value-based payment are really um, achieving the kinds of outcomes that we think that they will achieve. So in addition to creating these processes for collecting workforce data at both the provider and system levels, we're engaging national experts in workforce and workforce development and leveraging some funding that we earned through our MSC rebalancing demonstration to invest in training and technical assistance to providers that will help them understand and adopt a number of different evidence-based and best practices that we know through the research can help providers increase their re recruitment and retention. Um, and ultimately, that leads to better outcomes for the people that they serve. Turning to the next slide then, those investments are accompanied by incentives. So once we've taught providers the practices that we believe will help them lead to better outcomes, we want to incentivize them to actually do those practices. So we will incentivize those data collection and reporting processes. We will incentivize providers to use their workforce data to actually drive the improvements that they want to implement as a provider. We will incentivize them to adopt those evidence-based and best practices that they've been taught, um, including things around organizational culture and business model that are important as models of delivering home and community-based services continue to change. And then finally, we want to align the incentives at the worker level by creating a strategy whereby DSP or direct support professional wages can be increased as people continue to elevate their level of competency and training and when they complete the workforce development program. 
once all of those things have been done and we've incentivized those practices that we believe will get us to the better outcomes, then we'll transition our value-based payment models to actually looking at workforce and quality of life outcomes, knowing again that having a career ladder for the workforce is an essential part of that outcome, but that ultimately the outcomes for the people that we serve will be the most important measure of whether this tool has been successful in helping us achieve the transformation that we're looking for. Finally, just a quick look at um, some of the lessons we've learned along the way. On the last slide, as Michelle mentioned, DVP is a tool, and so it's really important to understand what you're trying to achieve with it and to make sure that this is the right tool and, and to know how to put it to work to essentially achieve those outcomes. We've talked a lot about the importance of stakeholder engagement and transparency with those stakeholders. Um, I've talked a fair bit about the importance of taking your time and really building capacity for providers to achieve the kinds of outcomes that you want to be able to achieve. We all know that it's important to be flexible and adapt the approach as we learn. Um, we've certainly uh, taken a number of detours in our, in our path or journey to value-based payments, but I think they've all been worthwhile. Um, to the extent that you can roll out a program with value-based payment strategies baked in, that's much easier than trying to go back and rebuild one for all of the financial reasons that we talked about earlier. Um, I, I think we, we, it requires a lot of planning and a lot of communication to really be able to implement value-based payment. And then finally, in closing, it is harder than you think it will be. It will take longer than you think, but most importantly, um, it has the potential to accomplish more than you could ever imagine. And in the end, I, I think it's totally worth all of that effort. Patty, thank you so much um, for your fantastic presentation on Tennessee's efforts. Um, we are going to turn it now to Deborah Lipson, who is a national expert on VBP models and quality and performance measurement. Um, and then after uh, Deborah's remarks, uh, to sum up this webinar, we will turn to questions and answers. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I, I really uh, am so impressed by all of the presentations today and, um, and the guide uh, that you will shortly have available to you has a lot more details. So let me just take a few minutes here just to echo and reinforce three really important points that I think um, the uh, attendees should really take home with them today. Uh, one has to do with accountability. And second has to do with thinking about a lot of things and selecting the quality measures that you use for value-based payment programs. And the third involves the staging and sequencing of value-based payment program development. So the first one, accountability. Um, I think value-based payment is fundamentally about holding plans and providers accountable, but the question is who really should be held accountable for what? I think we've heard today that New York and Tennessee made different decisions about what to hold plans and providers accountable for. In New York, um, the plans and providers are, are supposed to be accountable for potentially avoidable hospital admissions, for example, among other things. In Tennessee Choices programs, um, it, the state is encouraging providers to be accountable for staff training and demonstration and demonstrated acquisition of skills. Um, but as we've talked about several times today, uh, stakeholders and particularly health plans and home and community-based service providers have pretty strong views about the things that they can or cannot influence and what they can improve. Health plans, for example, could argue they, if they don't cover acute care services for MLTSS enrollees, they shouldn't be held accountable for hospital use since they can't deny authorization or payment, for example. Health plans could also argue that hospital use represents the combined effects of LTSS, medical care, maybe even the social determinants of health, many of which are not within the control of health plans or home and community-based service providers. But New York came to a different conclusion, that by assuring access to needed HCBS and effective care coordination, plans and providers can help their enrollees avoid unnecessary ER visits and hospital admissions. But the same kinds of debates are likely to come up in your state 
Um, and they're really important to have so that all stakeholders say yes, what it, you know, agree on what it, it's possible to be accountable for. Um, as Khalil noted at the end of his presentation, it remains a challenge even in New York to identify providers' ability to control the total care and, and quality of services. Um, so uh, even in New York, it, it remains an issue deciding which entity can and should be responsible for which outcomes is both the starting point for a lot of these programs and likely to be an ongoing issue over time. Secondly, selection of appropriate quality measures. Um, as Michelle said in her remarks and, and Patty has emphasized, um, when selecting quality measures for value-based payment programs, it's important to choose those that are first and foremost relevant, that is closely tied to the overarching goals that you have in your state for quality improvement for home and community-based services, and are feasible for plans and providers to measure. What I found in my experience is it can be really hard to achieve both of these objectives with the same sets of measures. Um, clearly, uh, as Patty has always emphasizes, and I think what we all know is that what's most relevant to beneficiaries and their family or caregivers is quality of life, having choice and control over the providers and services that they receive, becoming integrated into the community or, or becoming more integrated into the community, and having timely access to the services and supports that are most important. But these outcomes are more difficult to measure than measures of structure or process. They typically require surveys or other methods of obtaining beneficiary views of their care experience through using uh, surveys, for example, like the National Core Indicator Survey and the Home and Community-Based Services CAPS Experience of Care Services surveys. These are really important, but they can be expensive to administer, so they're usually conducted just once a year with beneficiaries and with a sample of them rather than continuously with all beneficiaries. So plans and providers say, yeah, these are important, but they don't give us the information we need to know on a regular basis to know if we're on track or why to the mark. That's why it's important to pair these measures with other kinds of structure and process measures, like workforce retention and training, maybe even things like flu vaccinations that we all know are more actionable. It's very clear what is expected, who was responsible, and how to improve those scores. The final point I want to make, um, and again, this has been said several times, so I'm really just trying to underline it um, to make sure that everybody really gets it, is the staging and sequencing issue. Planning and implementing these programs for long-term services and supports, health plans and providers, just like programs of this sort for all other kinds of health plans and providers, requires developing the models over time. Um, making sure that the metrics and the payment models match provider and workforce capacity. In the guide, in the remarks by New York and Tennessee, we talk a lot about phasing in these requirements over time. Michelle framed it as go slow. That doesn't mean you need to take 10 years, but it does, need, uh, does mean you need to take stock of where plans and providers are now, plan your program accordingly, monitor progress along the way, and adjust accordingly. For example, before you set those performance targets, find out what the distribution of scores on those measures is um, that you plan to use. Um, conduct an environmental scan or other you know, data collection to figure out whether providers can relatively easily collect the data or report those measures and figure out what exactly is their ability to take on financial risk and at what level. It's probably gonna be different for different kinds of providers and plans. Um, these are all lessons that we've learned in other kinds of value-based payment programs. For example, many of your states are involved in what are called DISRIP demonstrations, delivery system reform incentive payment programs. that are focused more on safety net hospitals um, and other kinds of safety net providers in the medical field. These are all the lessons that we've learned there as well. Typically, providers start out by earning payments just for investing in infrastructure developing partnerships with other providers, developing their data systems that allow them to construct quality metrics, recruiting and training healthcare workers. In subsequent years of these demonstrations, providers then receive funds just for reporting these quality and, and other kinds of metrics, but then only in the final years of the demonstration, which could be three, four, even five years later, are providers actually rewarded for their performance on the metrics. 
Um, I just want to close um, with, and again, Patty said this so well, so all I'm doing is reinforcing this point. Never, we can't lose sight of the ultimate goal. Um, the question is not just whether providers participate more in these value-based payment arrangements or even the share of managed long-term services supports health plan payments that are made to providers through these arrangements and whether they increase over time. We'll only know if we're successful if and when the adoption of these value-based payment programs and other payment reforms is shown to improve quality and outcomes for Medicaid beneficiaries using home and community-based care. That means value-based payment is a means to the end, not the end itself. So only when we have results from really good evaluations will we know if the promise of value-based payment is fulfilled. Back to you, Michelle. Excellent, thank you. Thanks so much for wrapping up our presentation so nicely, Deborah. Um, so we have a bunch of questions coming in. We'll see how many we can go through. And many, most of them are for, um, New York and Tennessee. So I will just throw out some questions and whoever um, would like to answer uh, the questions, please do. The first one really um, speaks to Deborah's second point, which is to think about, um, about considerations when selecting quality measures and how to think about measuring quality of life and consumer choice and the things that are ultimately likely most important to an individual. So how, when, for, so for um, Patty, Aaron, Kate, and Cleo, when you were designing these programs, how much did member personal choice and satisfaction figure, or measures of that figure into your program? So I'll jump in quickly. Um, you could see from the quality framework slide that we provided for our nursing facility quilt program that satisfaction and culture change quality of life figured very prominently, 65% uh, in fact of the total points were really around those two sets of measures. And again, all of this was really based on very direct feedback that we received from forums across the state with people who received services, their family members, and other key stakeholders. Thank you. Hi, and, is, oh, oh, no, please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Hi, this is um, um, Cal from New York. Um, so um, patient satisfaction is part of our um, uh, quality initiative um, uh, program that we have with the plans, that, with the, that the state has with the plans. Um, um, it is... Uh, it, it, satisfaction surveys are not, um, are not particularly included in in BBP arrangements, um, um, but uh, uh, I mean we tend to uh, try to uh, include as much to to the, to the greatest extent possible um, outcome based measures, uh, but uh, this is something that we can uh, kind of also we're we're we're, we're it, business interaction is definitely very important and is very high on on, on our list. Uh, but it, but we we just want to make sure that that there is the 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 the, the results that we get uh, accurately reflect um, um, the results of the of, of uh, the, uh, the outcomes um, the quality outcomes uh, the, the quality of care outcomes basically. Um, but yes, it is part of our overall quality uh, initiative in New York State, but not specifically for BBP. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question I think uh, for both of you is um, outside of some of the um, incentives that Patty mentions where um, providers or workers can likely at some point earn incentives for uh, participating in training. Has there been consideration of sharing um, incentive payments or um, you know, performance payments with the community organizations that help them achieve the role, or that help them achieve the value? Hi, this is Erin Kate from New York. And um, our answer here is similar to the last one. We do have a very robust workforce incentive training program in New York State. And while it's not specifically tied to VBP, 
it is um, part of the funding that accompanied our district grant when we received it. So to that end, it is to support the district goals in which VBP is also a large supporter of our district goals. So we have a workforce investment organization program um, that we are funding and it takes um, participating plans who had to meet certain criteria and it teams them up with these workforce investment organizations and they are in the process now of their first year of um, training all of the workforce in the region of the state in which they are located with the, uh, the aim of um, keeping, retaining, and retraining of AIDS in that, any home care aid in that region. And in Tennessee, while we only direct link between uh, wages or compensation um, and quality would be as we think about the completion of the training requirements currently, we have a number of staffing measures which really look at things like uh, retention, which look at the satisfaction of the workforce, which really measure things which have a, a much broader impact than, than, than just wage. So uh, we believe that by uh, having that array of metrics focused on the workforce, we will incentivize providers to think not just about wages, but about other policies and practices and things which will ultimately uh, improve um, the quality of the workforce overall, and that will that too will have a very positive benefit um, both for the workforce and for the people that we support. That, that's great, thank you. Um, the next question has to do with individuals that have significant needs, which is you know a, a likely scenario in a long-term services supports program. Um, if organizations work with individuals who have significant needs and might which might mean that their outcomes are not as as good as others do you have any incentives to providers to work with those populations in these programs so if you look for example at the the approach to value-based payment in our employment and community first choices program you'll note that in a couple of the different cases we have tiered the payments to providers based on the level of need of the people supported. Again, recognizing that it may take a greater investment from a provider to achieve those same outcomes with a person who has more significant disabilities than it might with someone whose disabilities impact them less on a day-to-day -day basis. I do think it's important that we think about um, the, the various levels of, of need and risk of a population as we put together our value-based payment approaches. Uh, this is Deborah Lipson, and I just wanted to add that that's why um, a measure like potentially avoidable hospitalizations that is used in New York, um, to the extent possible, really needs to be risk adjusted. Uh, so that they're, they're, you know, providers are not penalized um, for taking care of people who have uh, multiple chronic conditions or maybe quite elderly or, you know, other kinds of things that would increase their likelihood of having to uh, use the hospital appropriately. I would Hi, add Deborah, that. Darren, Kate, and uh -huh. I can tell you we look at it just slightly differently, although we do see your point and I do see the way you're looking at it. We look at it slightly differently in New York and, and that is that we leave the flexibility for the plans and the providers to set their own standards. Um, we don't, as, as a state, say to them, you need to improve by this much in order to get this kind of bonus. We allow the plans and the providers to set that for themselves. And in a community of patients where they have a higher acuity, for example, um, they, it might be that, they, that it's just a maintenance um, and not an improvement at all. So we allow for that kind of flexibility rather than risk adjusting, because if you risk adjust, then we're telling the providers that um, they're really competing against each other and what we're looking for is for each provider to compete against themselves in accordance with the measures that they set based on their own population. Remember too that there are, there are 
so many different ways to approach this work. So, for example, in the uh, behavioral health crisis prevention intervention stabilization model that I talked about, um, and the, the claims-based measures that we're using, these are not population-based measures where we're um, comparing a, a more acute population against a population that's potentially less acute, but it, instead what we're looking at is pre and post. So what did utilization look like before people came into the model? What did it look like while they were in the model? What did it look like after they left the model? And did we achieve significant gains over the course of time? And are they sustainable once the person leaves that model? That can become a, a different way of really looking at it uh, that provides for a fair comparison because you really are looking at the same population over the course of time. Great, thank you. So I think we have time for one more question and just to note that if there are additional questions that come in after the webinar, um, we can track who sends them and we're happy to follow up um, with you offline. Um, so one other question, uh, to what extent were federal authorities or CMS approval required to implement these programs um, beyond the standard 1915C waiver and understanding actually that Tennessee and New York have, have 1115 waivers. So I'm just cu curious how you worked with the federal government to implement these programs. In New York, um, we have what we referred to in our slide deck as the roadmap. And the roadmap was the agreement that we entered into with CMS that is the structure of our value-based payment arrangements and what we were going to do over the course of the district years in order to achieve our particular goals. We um, annually examine and make any changes that are required to the roadmap as is necessary and we submit it to CMS and get their approval on it. So that's what we do with CMS in New York. And in Tennessee, I would say that it varies substantially by program authority. Um, so, for example, in our MLTSS programs, um, while most payment methodologies are in a managed care delivery system are not governed by the terms and conditions of the waivers to the extent that there are directed payments involved, then CMS has to approve those directed payment processes. Um, we've taken some of the things that we've learned in our 1115 demonstration, though, and are walking them over into our Section 1915C waivers. And in that case, they represent a fairly substantial change in reimbursement methodology and therefore have to be approved as amendments to those, uh, each of those waiver programs. Thank you all um, for answering these questions and for submitting these questions. Um, I want to end a minute early to give you all an opportunity to fill out an evaluation that will pop up on your screen after this is, uh, webinar is done. Your feedback is extremely important to us as we plan um, related and additional activities. I also wanted to thank um, our wonderful speakers, Cal, Aaron, Kate, Patty, and Deborah and also give a huge thank you to Amy and her colleagues at the West Health Policy Center for supporting this important work. Um, lastly, the webinar will be posted on our website along with our new publication that um, goes into more detail on uh, several of the items and topics that were covered today. So thank you, thank you for joining and uh, please, please fill out the uh, evaluation to help us with our work. Thank you very much. Thank you.